Hello, everyone. Um, this presentation rests uneasily between um, two poles. Uh, on the one hand, it's part of a larger project um, which has a handbook to, for non-biblical academics um, as the intended readers, and then the other poll is this particular conference as a biblical studies event. Um, and when I initially gave James my title, I had the former, that is non-BS uh, academics in mind, and this has framed my presentation. So I realize that I'll be preaching to the choir and presenting you with problems and considerations which you most probably already are aware. So I hereby issue a blanket apology for each and every time you think, duh. <clears throat> Another problem is that my own interests are more along the lines of politics in the Bible, so I have chosen translation as an attempt at approaching Bible in politics and thus connecting the ancient context and contemporary appropriation in some fashion. But rest assured, I will be harping on about the same old, same old. So in her study on translation, history, and colonialism, Teashwini Niranjana bemoans the lack of awareness of the, of the, quote, constructed nature of cultural translations in that translation is always producing rather than merely reflecting or imitating an original, end quote. Niranjana's discussions pertain primarily to translations of colonial literature into English, but we can use it to remind ourselves of the, as, of the Bible as end product of multiple struggles, practices of mastery, and imperialist history. Duh. So, the first section and the largest of the paper deals with a cross-section of translations of two biblical texts from 1 Kings and one from John. The first text is uh, 1 Kings 10, 14 to 15, uh, which lists the amount of gold Solomon had. And the second text is 1 Kings 10, 26 to 29, which also boasts of Solomon's wealth in terms of silver, cedar, horses, and chariots. And so these, I've made a couple of slides with the, with the text on. And so obviously that's the Hebrew text, and then that my very clumsy translation, which is not meant to flow in any way, but just to sort of give an idea of sort of what the words signify in, in some way. Um, so the problem with this one is that the text of um, 1 Kings 10, 14 to 15, it seems that the Hebrew text um, poses a bit of difficulty because the English demands a word which connects the relationship between 14 and 15. And um, so I've just sort of juxtaposed them, and so they don't really connect, as you can see in my translation. And the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 666 kikar. Um, apart from seeking people and traffic of peddlers and all the kings of Arabia and the tributaries of the land. So I've come with a couple of examples from translations and how they solve this problem. And I begin with the least invasive, um, and they're the translations of the King James Version um, and the American Standard Version. And they both insert, insert a that that I've put in bold. Um, and then if we take the American Standard Version, now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold, besides that which the traders bought and the traffic of the merchants and all the kings and so on. And so if we then move on to the next one, which is, of course, an earlier translation, um, Wycliffe's translation, and I am not going to read that out loud. Um, I don't know if anyone offers. <laughs> but uh, what the, I've highlighted, and I can see that doesn't come across quite well in, um, on the screen, but um, Wycliffe puts in rentis um, as that which connects, well, and uh, that is as well, but he puts in as a more specific term as that which connects the gold in, in uh, verse 14 and 15. Um, and then we turn to the Good News translation and New International Version, and we see that they have taken equal liberties in interpreting this that. So every year, King, this is the Good News translation, 
Every year, King Solomon received over 25 tons of gold, in addition to the taxes paid by merchants, the profits from trade and tribute paid by the Arabian kings and the governors of the Israelite districts. And uh, the New International Version, the weight of the gold that Solomon received yearly was 666 talents, not including the revenues from merchants and traders and from all the Arabian kings and the governors of the land. So the crucial word which is being translated as rentis in Wycliffe, that in King James and American Standard, tax in Good News, and revenue in the New International Version is not there in the Hebrew text. But verse 15 seems to refer back to the gold in verse 14 so that it reads the gold that came to Solomon apart from all these people was 666 kikar. So while the insertion of the pronoun that refers back to the gold in verse 14, Wycliffe, Good News, and NIV happily deploy nouns from their own socioeconomic context to fill this gap, creating, as it were, an interpretation of the nature of the incoming gold. For Wycliffe, this is the feudal system, which is also indicated by the dukes, which was in his, uh, there, the, the dukes of the earth, and then we'll see in the next example, he refers to knights as well. Um, and the context for good news and NIV is, of course, capitalism. All right, so if we then turn to translations of uh, First Kings, 10, 26 to 9. Um, I'm particularly translated, uh, in, interested in the translation of the verb asaf in verse um, 26, and then sort of tangentially um, interested in the translation of the other verbs matza, lakach, ala, and yatza in 28 and 29. So, um, again, my own translation intends to show the problems of the text and very clumsy and but the text is very ambiguous. Uh, and what is interesting is how the various translations resolve the ambiguity and sharpen the focus of the text. So asaf, um, the verb in verse 26, will, as you will see, tra be, is translated as gathering together in the older translations. Um, so Wycliffe gathered together, in verse 26. Um, and King James as well gathered together. And then the Good News Bible and NIV, they have uh, built up and accumulated, respectively. Um, and of course, um, in particular, accumulate is a word that we should carefully note in that this is one of the basic principles of the circulation of capital in Marx's analysis in Das Kapital. So this, this circulation of commodities and capital uh, essential to capitalism is undoubtedly what goes on in the NIV translation of verses 28 and 29. If you look at what's going on there, Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from, and I'm tempted to say Kui, but that's probably not how you pronounce it, but with, um, the royal merchants purchased them from, how would you pronounce that, someone? Q, Kui? Whatever. Um, the royal merchants purchased them from <clears throat> at the current price. They imported a chariot from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. They also exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and of the Arameans. And so I'll just pop back to my sort of whatever. And so the horses were taken out of Egypt and gathered from this place. A, a king took them and gathered uh, them um, or from this place at a price. Carriage came up and went out from Egypt, and you get the picture, right? I mean, there's not a lot of export, import, and profit margin here, um, but that's what we then get in the NIV. So, and the Good News translation, though initially occupied with Solomon's militarization of his empire, through this building up of a force of 1,400 chariots and 12,000 cavalry horses goes into total overdrive when it comes to the circulation of the horses and the chariots. Um, the king's agent controlled the export of horses from Masri and Kilikia and the export of chariots from Egypt. They supplied the Hittite and Syrian kings with horses and chariots, selling chariots for 600 pieces of silver each and horses for 150 each. Um, so here, Egypt is included in Solomon's fear of economic 
Solomon's sphere of economic influence in that Solomon is in control of the Egyptian export and is the one making the profits as a crucial element of the supply chain. So these examples were merely to show the extent of contemporary socioeconomics on the translation of the Bible and to pose the question how people with no access to the Hebrew text can come to grasp the inescapably ideological translations of the Bible or to use one of Hughes' phrases, come to terms with the socioeconomic meme pool which constitutes its host. Another example whose taming is of a more, sort of at surface level at least, is of a more theological nature is from John. And so in my recent work on the body of Jesus in John, it eventually became clear to me that basically the whole interpretation um, of John rested on two words, en humin, or among us, in 1.14. So the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, and so on. Now, every single interpretation of Jesus in John authorizes itself on these two words, ultimately. It, that's what it comes back to in the end. And there is only one commentator who considers the alternative, and let's face it, much more likely translation of in us. C.K. Barrett notes in his commentary that enhumin does not mean that the word he says, Enhumin does not mean that the word dwelt in our human nature as in a tent. Though the old Syriac rendering, ban, in us, may be held to suggest this, end quote. Barrett, of course, does not argue the point, but merely states it to be so. While Bultmann does not consider this interpretation, he does provide an interesting parallel in his discussion of Minine N in um, 538, um, where he notes that the evangelist speaks of the word abiding in the hearer, or rather to be very precise, the verse reads, and this is taken from the New Revised Standard Version, um, you have never heard his voice or seen his form, and you do not have his word abiding in you because you do not believe him whom he has sent. And finally, uh, the Nag Hammadi treatise, Trimorphic Protonoia, which is the self-revelation of the first thought, refers to the manifest, manifestation of, quote, myself to them in their tents, uh, end quote. And that's an interpretation which Jan Helderman notes is a conscious reinterpretation, reinterpretation of John 1.14. The point of the translation in us is, of course, a sharpening of Anz Kesemann's work on John, which showed how that which is uniquely Johannine had been repressed or domesticated within New Testament exegesis of his day. Kesemann noted that the statement in John 1.14a, the word became flesh, had been overly emphasized by historical critical exegesis in order to force the text to follow a more traditional line of interpretation, namely, quote, the possibility of writing the earthly story of Jesus, end quote. Kesemann, on the other hand, preferred to emphasize the confession which follows this statement, namely, we beheld his glory. And that led him to his famous assessment of John as pre or naively docetic. So, the word became flesh and lived among us is, in Johannine scholarship, regarded as an untranscendable, non-negotiable guarantee for Jesus having flesh, hence a body, hence being human, hence having lived, and so on. Um, and so firmly lodged is this translation and interpretation that contesting it amounts to borderline madness in the eyes of John scholars, which it's in itself should cause heightened awareness. Um, the translation of in us um, actually supports the general contempt or even revulsion which this particular book shows towards the realm of everyday labor, uh, life, bread, and its flesh. Okay, so why should we then stop at translation? Um, we could go back a step further and consider the composite nature of the biblical text. In Criticism of Heaven, uh, Roland Bohr shows how Ernst Bloch examines the imposition of ruling class ideologies on the biblical text, as well as the strategies of subversive slave talk. <laughs> 
Bloch is interested in masked or underground texts, which are subversive texts that have subsequently been redacted or rendered subversive through later usage. The function of these texts is to appease and criticize rulers at one at the same time. And an example which Bloch gives is the text of Korah's rebellion in Numbers 16, which tells of a priestly rebellion. Are you checking Facebook? I'm tweeting you. Oh, OK. <laughs> 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 Number 16, which, t <laughs> which tells of a priestly rebellion on the issue of ritual and incense, which is <laughs> crushed through divine intervention. Bloch is interested in the divine intervention and how God opens the ground, which swallows up Korah and his conspirators, um, <coughs> as an example to anyone else who would rebel. This is, according to Bloch, a god of white guard terror who emerges from the redactor's pen. And this rebellion is the echo of political rebellion which reverberates through the text. This is not only indicated by the punishment, but also the perpetual recurrence of the Israelites grumbling throughout the chapter. For Bloch, this indicates a rebellious anti-Yahweh Yahweh voice that has been turned into something else. The sign of disobedience, sorry, the quote began with a rebel quote, a rebellious anti Yahweh voice that has been turned into something else, the sign of disobedience and recalcitrance on the part of the people themselves. End quote. Now I know this sounds totally old school and that the idea of tracing redactional seams in the text has become an abhorrence to many. But I think the idea of the, uh, domestic, uh, domesticating the politically radical nature of the text before we even begin to translate it, a fruitful one, especially given the efforts of translations to smooth the rough edges and make the text easily digestible. And nowhere is this more clear than in the meaning-based translations spreading like tongues of fire in every language under the sun in attempts to resurrect a dormant Christianity. These Bibles, the Good News Translation, which are included in the examples here, and the Gute Nachricht Bible in German, and the New Auteile in Danish, along with the international translations, or sorry, intermedial translations, such as the Bible Illuminated and the Manga Bible, all attempt to erase the distance between the ancient cultural context and our later one, thereby enculturating the Bible to a particular context, excuse me, and more importantly, neutralizing its challenges to contemporary society. As Marx noted in a different but not entirely unrelated context, quote, with so complete a difference between the material economic conditions of the ancient and the modern class struggles, the political figures produced by them can likewise have no more in common with one another than the Archbish Archbishop of Canterbury has with the High Priest Samuel, end quote. So, to conclude, I want to cite a number of questions. And I'm sure you're all familiar with these questions in one way or another. Where is the manuscript of the Bible? There are two sections. There are four different Gospels, canon. There are more Gospels outside the Bible. And last but not least, what do you mean fragments? Now, these questions, and more just like them, have arisen in conversations with people obviously not as well versed in the intricacies of Bible basics as we are. I'm not only, only re repeating these snippets of conversation to poke fun at people, but also to remind us of how much, or in this case, how little people actually know about the Bible as an ideological product. Also, this lack of knowledge at knee-jerk level, not to mention the surprise when corrected or informed, shows the position of the Bible as a saintly relic rather than as a collection of texts. Um, so I want to close with these sort of ponderings or considerations. To what extent do we participate in perpetuating this mystification and would we consider it a necessity to inform people of what goes on in the theological engine room before the book even hits the streets in all its rapidly increasing configurations? Thank you.